What's going on YouTube, it's Deej, back again with another video. And today, we start another three-round NFL 2023 mock draft. Today, we have round one, then Saturday, you'll get round two. Capping off the weekend on Sunday with the round three portion of this updated mock. And before we get started, had a couple things I just wanted to talk about off the top and a question to ask all of you. One, I just want to say thank you. I actually just passed 20,000 uh, hours worth of watch time on YouTube. So, it's something I didn't really... Think I would ever hit when I started the channel a couple of Januarys ago, but seriously, thank you all for uh, taking the time to click on this video, whether you're a subscriber, returning viewer, or this is your first time seeing it. Seriously, I appreciate you just clicking on one video and spending some time with me, listening to me talk about football. And if you're a returning viewer, I appreciate you doing that more than once. And of course, if you're new around here, be sure to subscribe. We've been growing uh, pretty rampant of late, and I'm really excited about that. And that just gets me uh, fired up to bring even more football content your way. So definitely subscribe if you're new, like if you enjoyed today's video. And my question to ask you with a plenty of other things you can comment throughout this video, but who do you think ultimately holds that number one overall pick? I mean, we're starting to hear rumblings that, you know, maybe Justin Fields is expendable and, and the Bears maybe will hold on that number one pick. I think part of that is just to kind of get some extra discussion going on and try to stoke more uh, fuel in the direction uh, of what that number one overall pick could get them. You kind of hear Houston talking about, oh, well, we might take the best defensive player available. So, you know, you got smoke screens from so many different teams. Will the Colts move up? Is Carolina really interested? You know, you, you know these teams putting out reports trying to throw off the other side of the deal. So, you know, is this one of those examples? Or do you think there's a shot that Chicago sticks and picks at one, maybe moves on from fields? Or... Like I said, simply put, who do you think picks number one overall? With that said, I have it being the Indianapolis Colts in today's mock draft. Went ahead and did the trade off uh, video just to keep this moving quicker. And, you know, mock draft database, uh, I've said this a thousand times. But the one flaw of their website, unfortunately, is uh, the pick for pick trades. And if you've been wondering, well, he always says that, like, why doesn't he do anything about it? Um, it's really because of this section here. Not many other, and I don't think I've found any other mock draft simulator that allows you to see your previous picks for a team. And to me, that is the most valuable thing I could add to a video. And I could do, especially considering I break my rounds up uh, by day. So I find that to be a very useful source and a very useful tool. So therefore, I kind of neglect the fact that, you know, the pick for pick swaps aren't always great. Hopefully we get those trades before draft night. And that way, once those trades happen, we're covered. So anyways, let's go ahead and start talking about the Indianapolis Colts at pick number one. No surprise here. I am going to take Bryce Young. Uh, you know, to me, he's in a QB tier of his own. So it makes sense that he's the number one guy off the board. That's why I think Chicago should trade the pick. To me, Bryce Young should be the number one overall pick this year. So if you're the Bears and you're not in on the field, or excuse me, the young market, and you're going to stick with fields, then go ahead and ship the pick. You try to get some extra assets. So I've talked about this pick a thousand times. I think this makes the Colts a really kind of scary team pretty much right away because I like the offensive line. Uh, I like the wide receivers. Uh, the, obviously a great running back. Uh, and I'm excited about the uh, direction this team is going, you know, with Shane Steichen as the uh, head coach. It is interesting to kind of think about Shane Steichen kind of paired up with one of the toolsy quarterbacks like a Will Levis or maybe a trade back into Anthony Richardson or if they view Anthony Richardson as a top four player, maybe. Uh, but mostly you'll hear the, you know, the Levis and Steichen, you know, kind of uh, pairing and Steichen do what he did with Herbert and Jalen Hurts with Will Levis. Kind of explore that in last week's mock. So want to do something a little different here. We have the Colts move up to one and take in Bryce Young. And that takes us to the Houston Texans. This is where I'm going to have Will Levis coming off the board. And hey, man, I mean, we're a little more than a week away uh, from Indy getting the combine. So I'm excited about that. Uh, and I'm really excited to just hear the QB chatter. I mean, like, where do a lot of teams stand on this? You know, what does, you know, you are starting to hear, you know, Anthony Richardson, he's got first round grades all the way down to fourth round grades from teams and you know there's some chatter that maybe will levis could be the number one guy on a lot of different teams board so again part of that smoke screen season you're gonna have teams trying to throw off the other one and you know get them off their scent you know so to speak but i do think there is some truth in that so i'm really fascinated to hear you know coming out of the combine it's like yeah will levis is the guy shooting up boards kind of when we started to hear trevon walker was you know maybe in play uh as you know the number one pick for the jacksonville was at the combine so did we find something out did we gotta get uh you know a feel for where the NFL stands on these quarterbacks? I certainly hope so because I am fascinated to see how that plays out. Let me get to the Cardinals and uh, very chalky here. We're going to go Will Anderson followed by Jalen Carter at four. I've said this a thousand times, so uh, won't harp on it too, too much, but whether it's this order of the picks or it's the other way around with Jalen Carter going to Arizona, then Will Anderson going to Chicago, it's an A grade for me either way. These two teams desperately need defensive help. Uh, and especially look at you know the Cardinals hiring you know former defensive coordinator for the Eagles, Jonathan Gannon. He's going to want to clean up that side of the ball. And plus, they're a couple years away. I think a lot of their work uh, this offseason is going to be focused on the trenches. So that way in a year or two, uh, you know, you got Kyler fully back healthy. He'll be back at some point next year, but... 
talking about having him as a week one starter in two years time and then hopefully by then they have enough pieces in place to where this rebuild slash retool of sorts uh has kind of fully hit its peak and that way the cardinals are a legit team there in the nfc west and for the bears like i mean i think jalen carter's the exact three tech that matt eberflus was trying to get with larry ogan joby last year but hey jalen carter's you know, long term, I'd rather have Jalen Carter on my roster than Larry Ogunjobi. And plus, he won't cost you $54 million over three years like Ogunjobi's uh, deal was going to be before he failed his physical. Also, probably another good reason why that uh, signing didn't go through. So get there, get your guy here with Jalen Carter. And, you know, especially now with Deron Payne sounding like he's going to be franchise tag, this to me comes the best way for them to fill that position. So uh, you do run the risk of maybe Arizona taking them at three. So maybe there is value in sticking and picking at one and getting your guy. I think next week's mock might explore something like that. Uh, but nonetheless, in this scenario, you get extra picks. You still get your guy at four. So it's a, it, it's a true win there uh, for Chicago, at least talking about this specific pick. Uh, then we get to Seattle at pick five. And uh, I have three trades. We've already done one. This is going to be a, another one. So we're going to have uh, Seattle moving back and trading places with Carolina. And again, you know, the picks might not totally work out, but I did get this from the Jimmy Johnson trade chart. So Carolina's going to give up 9, 61, and 93 just to get it, you know, close enough. I guess they would have accepted the trade without 60 or 93 in there, but. Nonetheless, we're going to give those extra day two picks to Seattle. And in turn, Carolina gets to draft C.J. Stroud. Um, I definitely think they're in on this quarterback market. I think ideally they're looking for the rookie class. Um, and again, I'm excited to hear the chatter. You know, who does Frank Reich like? Who does Dave Tepper like? You know, um, kind of those rumblings of, you know, what quarterback is kind of hot name right now. So uh, if C.J. Stroud's the third quarterback off the board, I, I think that's uh, an awesome spot. I do think three quarterbacks in the top five is, is plausible. Uh, sure, Seattle could stick and pick there uh, but we will address quarterback actually on Sunday so I'm excited to talk about that then but you get an extra couple of uh, day two picks you move back to nine so you're still picking the top 10 and Carolina gets their franchise quarterback of the future is kind of a win all the way around next up is the Lions I'm going to stick with what I've had Devon Witherspoon this could certainly be Christian Gonzalez the more I you know think about those two the more I kind of go back and forth between Gonzalez and Witherspoon at one and two Gonzalez presents more size and some more weight here uh, but Witherspoon I think yeah, if we're talking about being NFL ready, like which of these corners would I trust to play tomorrow? Devon Witherspoon would probably be my guy to say is the most NFL ready. Six foot one, right around 180 pounds. I know the strength of the schedule wasn't necessarily crazy, and he is one of the smaller, you know, quote unquote corners. He's not quite Clark Phillips small or uh, Trevius uh, Hodges Tomlinson from DCU small, but comparing him to Keely Ringo and Christian Gonzalez and Joey Porter, yeah, he's a little bit smaller. This guy also just flies to ball carriers. This dude has. For a corner, he's got pretty awesome highlights when it comes to being a tackler and an enforcer there. Uh, but also the the coverage ability, it was really put on display. Only one yard allowed in press coverage last year. So you're telling me this guy can go get receivers at the line of scrimmage, and then when it's a run play, he's a willing tackler. I think all that kind of speaks to someone that would fit perfectly in with what you know Dan Campbell and what Aaron Glenn are looking to do, uh, and kind of fit with their culture. But then also schematically, I think he's a perfect fit for what Aaron Glenn is looking to add. So I'd love to see them pair Witherspoon up with Jeff Okuda, and honestly. This could be a team that doubles up the corner depending on how you feel about Jeff Okuda. So uh, this might not be the end of the cornerback, you know, uh, draft work uh, for Detroit. Next is the Las Vegas Raiders. I'm going to go Tyree Wilson here. Thought about Miles Murphy or, or even Lucas Van Ness, uh, but we're going to talk about those guys over the next couple of picks. So I have a little bit of a run on edge here. And honestly, these three guys, when you're talking about them as top 10 picks, you know, Wilson, Murphy, and Van Ness, it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily love them as top five guys, but... You know, the 7 through 10 stretch, yeah, I think that's a perfect spot to take a Wilson, take a Murphy, take a Van Ness. So, uh, and Van Ness, you know, right there at the fringe of the top 10. Like, I, I understand where people are excited about him. He's a little bit little bit younger. We'll talk about him in a moment. But Tyree Wilson, uh, whether Chandler Jones is going to work out or not, I think this is kind of your insurance policy just in case. And even if Chandler Jones does work, there's a world where I think Tyree Wilson can be able to kick inside or Max Crosby. He's been a guy who's pretty flexible uh, across the defensive line and where they have him aligned at. So, uh, no matter what... I think by taking a Wilson or a Murphy or even a Van Ness for that matter, you're going to be able to have ideally with Chandler Jones taking a step forward next year, your three best pass rushers out on the field all at the same time. I also think this is a team that logically Javon Hargrave makes a ton of sense. It's hard to project free agent signings, but I could totally see them going Javon Hargrave. And if they do make that type of investment in free agency paired up with a first round pick across the defensive line, that is that is how you reshape and retool that defensive line to get that pass rush to where it should be. Give Patrick Graham the DC a fair shot. Also, it should be said, this might not be in the Raiders' hands, depending on the Aaron Rodgers situation and what that uh, you know trade hole has to look like going to Green Bay. So we could be talking about the Packers picking here at 7, depending on uh, 
how this plays out. You know, at the time of me recording this, I'm like a day after, uh, you know, all the, the news and I see all these graphics put up, oh, Rodgers has emerged from the darkness. Like, <laughs> that, I guess that speaks to how, like, hungry and starved we are for NFL news that we're, like, making graphics about some dude coming out of a four-day retreat. But nonetheless, still all that to say, uh, lots to figure out still with Aaron Rodgers and where he's going to go, at least at the time of me recording this. Then we get the Falcons at pick eight. This is where we're going to have Lucas Van Ness actually come off the board. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that Van Ness goes before Miles Murphy because I think day one, he might be a more NFL-ready guy, at least as a pass rusher. Uh, Van Ness did a lot of his work at Iowa from the inside, but he definitely projects more as an, uh, you know, a 3-4 D end uh, kind of lineup between guards and tackles, maybe even outside of tackles, outside shoulders. So I think Atlanta can kind of give them that flexibility to move inside when necessary play on the edge, I think is also in the cards. And then also his strength profile and ability to turn an explosive first step into strength kind of uh, makes for a really nice pairing with Arnold Ebiketti on the other side. So you have one guy who wins with speed and finesse, one guy who wins with power uh, and explosive first step. Feels like a really nice pairing. Then again, Van Ness, I think, could kick inside once you get into passing situations. You have nickel dime sets. Four man rush could have him and Grady Jarrett on the inside, and then D'Angelo Malone and uh, Arnold Ebiketti on the edge. We'll see how, you know, year two treats those two guys because, you know, Malone is no guarantee to be, you know, a consistent player uh, in any sort of heavy, you know, pass rush role. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, then we get to Seattle in this round. I have Miles Murphy come off the board. Again, I. I may be crazy to think that, you know, Van Ness is going to go ahead of Murphy, but I really don't think it's that, you know, uh, far-fetched. Because uh, Miles Murphy is a work in progress. Because uh, he's 6'5", 275, and a freak athlete, I think he's kind of a nice addition for Seattle because I think immediately, high-level run defender, you're going to be able to get that pretty quick out of Miles Murphy. And for a Seattle team that, you know, leading into their very late to postseason push, like they were always in the picture for the playoffs. And then week 17, 18 was kind of when they cemented that they were going to be a playoff team. Uh, but the weeks leading up to week 17 and 18, yeah, that team's run defense was kind of rough. So I think immediately getting Miles Murphy there, a guy that can play inside and out, also just a body type that I don't think Seattle has right now. Some of the same stuff I've said about Tyree Wilson in previous mocks. I think Murphy becomes a valuable addition to get that type of high level run defender in a different body type. We can be looking at Miles Murphy as maybe the best pass rusher on this team. He just doesn't have any pass rush moves on tape yet. So it's one of those things where it's like, I don't know what to project because I haven't seen it. But that being said, you look at, you know, the work that Seattle's done uh, in a variety of positions, but specifically it's coming in the secondary, but they take these toolsy, insane frame players and they turn them into some of the best players in their respective positions. Now, it doesn't always work out, right? Like, you know, drafting, you know, they've had a hard time drafting edge rushers for, for that matter. Uh, and, you know, like picks like Jordan Brooks, I don't think have totally worked out, but a guy who was a freak athlete and, you know, who knows what his potential could have taken him to be. Uh, but if they got a Miles Murphy, I'd be excited about the prospects of what he could develop into. Uh, and he's just the kind of edge that they don't have right now. And plus, high level run defender, I think he gets some immediate impact with some optimistic, you know, future uh, with Miles Murphy potentially developing as a pass rusher. Because right now, he's just, he's just kind of starting from ground zero. So let's move into pick number 10. This round of Christian Gonzalez come off the board. Um, Right now, James Bradbury, a free agent. So I know Eagles fans are excited about the idea of him coming back, but there's no guarantee that he does. And plus, he turns 34 uh, before the, next, the start of next year. So this is an aging corner. Uh, I don't know if you necessarily want to pay him a whole lot of money. And if I'm James Bradbury, you know, I could be in for a one-year deal to then try to hit, you know, free agency again next year and get in the, you know, uh, the, the, the DraftKings money, you know, all the, the gambling money, the sports books money. Plus the TV money figures to kick in next offseason. So maybe he's looking for a one-year deal. Maybe that makes sense for Philadelphia to bring him back. But I could also see him being like, yeah, I'm in my mid-30s. I'm trying to get one last three to four-year contract and try to you know get a big payday. So he could break either way. And if he's looking for a multi-year deal, if I'm Philadelphia, yeah, he was great last year. But I'm not really interested in a 34-year-old corner at four years uh, and, you know, 15 to 18 to 20 million dollars a year so I'm good on that maybe one year contract we consider it but in the event that you know they can't come to that agreement Christian Gonzalez I think makes for a perfect replacement kind of has that same size speed profile uh that Bradbury brings to the table actually I think an inch taller might even have uh you know a wider wingspan uh but also younger and cheaper so that's obviously a big plus into it as well has the capability of being a man press guy uh, and especially with there were rumors that or there were reports that Vance Joseph was in on the mix for that DC job as well as Jim Leonard Joseph's going to Denver Leonard decided to pull his name out of the hat so uh or out of the candidacy hat I should say so still looking to figure out who that DC is going to be, but if it's someone who wants to incorporate more man, Gonzalez fits, or if it's someone who wants to continue with, you know, a cover four heavy defense, uh, and also you know, a fair amount of cover one in there with uh, Jonathan Gannon, I think Christian Gonzalez fits that. So whether it's man heavy, zone heavy, Gonzalez is a fit. 
all that to say. So let's move on to the Tennessee Titans, and I'm going to have to take in Paris Johnson Jr. here. So I'm back on my own line kick here for the Titans. I think it's the right pick. They've officially cut Taylor LeJuan. I've been saying that uh, you know for months now, plenty of other people as well. But they're an interesting team because it's also you know Robert Woods. They also cut Randy Bullock, and I can see Bud Dupree being in the mix. Zach Cunningham also makes a lot of sense to be cut. So a variety of veterans that they're going to be looking to replace. But I think left tackle is the spot where they have to get an upgrade because Dennis Daly is not it. And I think you felt the absence of you know a solid bookend tackle like a Taylor LeJuan. So Go get the number one tackle in this class, in my opinion, Paris Johnson Jr., 6'6", 315, great feet, and looked fantastic as a first-year starter at left tackle for Ohio State. And, you know, I've said this a thousand times as well. To me, you go back two years, and the fact that Ohio State was like, well, we have to find a way to get Paris Johnson Jr. on the field, so let's play him at right guard for then to him transition to play left tackle the next year. Um, that speaks to how good this guy is for one of the best rosters in college football. So if I'm an NFL team, I'm looking at that and saying, all right, well, the Buckeyes saw something pretty special. I should take that into my consideration. Also, kind of a fun storyline. You'd pair up Paris Johnson Jr. Uh, with Nicholas petit Friere, two former Buckeye uh, bookend tackles, and uh, kind of reuniting there in Tennessee. And actually, when Nicholas petit Friere was there, that's when Johnson was playing right guard. So uh, it'd be kind of cool to get to see these two at tackle for the first time, uh, one end of the line versus the other. So let's move on to Houston at pick 12. I'm going to go Quentin Johnston. Uh, this is a, a, you know, I've been going kind of defensive line of the last couple of mocks. Now I'm going to go wide receiver. Let me see Will Levis's arm paired up with, you know, 4 3 speed at Six foot four, 215 pounds. Like, I need to see it tomorrow <laughs> because that's that's something that gets me excited about a Houston team that haven't been excited about their offense in some time. Plus, you factor in Damian Pierce in the backfield. All of a sudden, that's a, that's a really scary trio to kind of have be the face of your uh, offense moving forward. Uh, but also a great satellite player so when you can just get the ball to him quick, get him in open space, and let him make DBs look silly because he did that a ton at TCU. So uh, no matter how you spin, I think Johnson brings a lot of value to this Houston team, specifically as a yards after the catch guy, but also a deep threat. Now, when you have Will Levis, this guy who, you know, uh, big arm, so, you know, kind of the, the big play capabilities are naturally there, but also like a guy who's, I think accuracy did take a step back last year and also the decision-making. I think that's kind of where... He heard a stop the most last year was the decision-making certainly left a lot to be desired. Um, so having someone like a Johnston where it's just like, no, 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 you're just, the read is get the ball to QJ and he's going to make the rest of the play happen. That feels like a, it could go a long way to kind of getting Will Levis uh, some more experience reading a defense and just kind of getting comfortable, especially early on in a game. I could see that being something that Houston goes to pretty often to get him comfortable into that weekend's contest. But anyways, let's move on to the Jets at pick 13. We're going to make it Peter Skronsky. It's been a pick that I've made plenty of times, and I do like it. Inside out flexibility. And honestly, Skronsky played all five positions. He was uh, recruited to go to Northwestern to be a center, which is crazy. So center guard tackle flexibility legitimately uh, in the cards, I think, with Skaronsky. So uh, no matter what happens with Dwayne Brown, George Fant, Mekhi Becton, Skaronsky can find a way to get on the field at one of those tackle positions or maybe even guard. Maybe they elect to make Elijah Vera Tucker a tackle as the guy who's going into his second year. Maybe I could see where the experience is something where they're like, yeah, we'd rather have that guy be uh, on the edge versus like as an interior player. But either way you spin it, Skaronsky will be able to find a way to get onto the field and be one of the five best offensive linemen for the Jets. So, therefore, I love this fiddle time. Uh, then we get to the New England Patriots. I've been going wide receiver heavy the last couple of mocks. I think it's been Quentin Johnson each of the last two. I'm going to stick across the offensive line. Let's go Broderick Jones here at 14. I mean, Isaiah Wynn's almost certainly gone. I think uh, uh, Trent Brown could also be a logical cut candidate. I think his, you know, it, it, with his release, they would save north of $10 million. So, he could be a name that hits free agency as well. But let's just say there's a world where maybe they restructure that contact, come to an agreement on a pay cut, or they just cut and then re-sign him. Trent Brown figures better uh, and has played better as a right tackle. So get Broderick Jones in the mix there at left tackle. Yeah, I think he's a bit of a work in progress as a pass protector. Uh, but even without you know some of the, the previous offensive line coaches, uh, Dante Skorakia, uh, who potential Hall of Fame type of coach there as an offensive lineman. He was there in New England forever. And he was a huge reason for why it always felt like the, the Pats had a good offensive line. He's not there anymore, but I still trust New England as a team that can develop offensive linemen. So if there's a place for Bra uh, Broderick Jones to go to and to potentially hit his best, I think New England's one of those destinations where he could become the best version of himself. Plus, the need is evident there for New England and you know, it's defense or offensive line seemingly every year for uh, Bill Belichick. So we'd love to see Broderick Jones be the pick here, address an area of need, and then let's try to work on that contract with uh, Trent Brown, and then let's figure out where he can fit into the mix, whether it's at right tackle uh, or you're moving on and finding a different option there for that position. 
Let's move on to the Packers at pick 15. Going to continue to do what I've done, I think, at least over last week's mock, but maybe even the last two. Nolan Smith just makes a ton of sense. This is your Preston Smith replacement in a year's time. Uh, High-end athlete, highly talented recruit, uh, and a high-level run defender this past year prior to the uh, pectoral injury that ended his season early. Uh, so I think there is you know benefit for him to be able to see the field right away, especially in early downs. Like I could see him, that being his role in year one, and then Preston Smith maybe keeping him fresh by having him be kind of the passing down guy that swaps in one Smith for another. I could see that roll pretty quickly. And then, like I said, in a year's time, move on from Preston Smith, save a lot of money against the cap, uh, and then Nolan Smith becomes your starter. And then your trio becomes Sean Gary, Nolan Smith, and Kingsley and Agbury, who are all guys I liked coming out of college. So I would love to see that trio in Green Bay. So I think this pick makes a lot of sense. Washington Commanders. Last week, I went Brian Brzee. Obviously, the, it's pretty clear that Deron Payne is going to be franchise tag. So I think that pick was already kind of, you know, uh, a little bit different. I was kind of doing it to play around with different, you know, landing spots with Brzee and different, you know, uh, ways the Commanders could attack the first round so it was just kind of playing around with an idea but with pain coming back that pick becomes even more unlikely uh, so here at 16 let's take joey porter jr i think he'd be a fantastic fit in that del rio defense uh Add some size, 6'2", and a guy who got better and better year over year at Penn State. Only one career interception, but he is pretty good at the, at the, at the catch point, in my opinion. Uh, now, wasn't tested all that much. You know, he's another one of those guys, not quite Devon Witherspoon, uh, you know, type of a, a liability, maybe, when you go into a scouting profile, but didn't have the most insane, you know, production. Like, his best games this past year were, like, Purdue and Minnesota. And it's like, well, you know, who on Purdue is, and who on Minnesota is really cooking a guy who should be going in the middle of the first round? Probably not a lot of guys. Now, he did see Ohio State each last two years. And I don't think those are either one of his two best games during his career. So, give and take, he has seen some top-level competition. And maybe didn't fare too, too well against it. But, you know, I think did an okay enough job. Did better than most college corners did against you of, uh, Ohio State over the last two years. So, I think there is something to glean from there. But, uh, you know, even with maybe not the most insane level of competition, this is a guy where six foot two, long arms, and I think will test at least solid. I think it'll give you okay testing numbers when it comes to his 43 cone, that sort of stuff. Uh, that if I'm an NFL coach, I'm looking at this guy and be like, he's checking a lot of boxes. Get him in my system. Get him in this building. Let me work with him. We can make this. We can make the best of this. So uh, I definitely think mid first round is a solid value for him. Let me get to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Going to stay at the quarterback position. So Cam Smith. I had Cam Smith fall to the second round in last week's uh, mock, which you know baffled me. And uh, I don't think that's going to happen. I, I still think of him and Keely Ringo as first round guys, but both those guys kind of slipped the second round because I was kind of going uh, non corner heavy, just because I have been kind of corner heavy in a lot of these first. So again, playing with different possibilities. I want to make the same video week over week, uh, but. Things are going to go back to a little bit more to normal here because uh, I do think Cam Smith, Keely Ringo are first round guys. Smith is a really exciting prospect. Uh, not quite the guy that J.C. Horn was, but don't helmet scout. He's a different player. Uh, used a lot more in off coverage than J.C. Horn was, but I do think that man press uh, ability is in his game. Right around six foot, 185, 190 pounds. Darius Rush, actually the other uh, South Carolina corner in this draft, actually has a little bit longer wingspan, but I don't think arm length is any sort of concern for Cam Smith. So uh, I think a guy that, whether it's zone heavy and you play him in like an off coverage, like if he went to the Chargers and he was kind of plugged into this cover four heavy defense, that would be awesome. I think he'd be a great fit. Or if you want to put him in a team that runs a lot of man, let's say he went to the Lions uh, at 18 because they didn't go corner at six. I think that'd be an awesome fit. So I think he does bring that scheme versatility and just one of those players that, you know, aside from penalty issues last year, he just plays better than I think his size and his athletic profile would suggest. So just give me a dog. And I think that's kind of like a Mike Tomlin, you know, kind of mentality with it's like that dude's a dog. So let me get him. So uh, projecting a little bit there. Anyways, we get to the Lions at pick 18, and we're going to have our final trade of the first round. And I'm really excited. So Giants fans, let me hear your thoughts on this because I just spoiled it. It's going to be uh, a trade back with the New York Giants. And uh, if I'm making a move up, you can probably already tell um, what the position I'm targeting here is going to be. But we're going to have the Giants giving up uh, 25 and 89, which I don't think whatsoever is a bad cost uh, being able to move up seven spots. I am going to do another trade uh, next week with the Giants. Not quite this high up and it's going to be for a different position. This week we're going to go ahead and give them Anthony Richardson. So if you're a Giants fan, let me hear it down below. And even if you're just not a Giants fan but an NFL junkie and you're trying to figure out where these uh, quarterbacks go, do you think this is something that's plausible? Because go back in time, like four months, like the Giants, Anthony Richardson was in every mock draft because it made a ton of sense, right? Like Dayball, there was one coach in the NFL. I, th I think Dable would be the guy I'd want to have working with Anthony Rich. Not to take away anything from, you know, a Kyle Shanahan or a Sean Payton uh, or anybody else. A lot of other great head coaches across the league. 
I think Dayball, you know, uh, you know, squeezing every win possible to that roster last year, a big part of the mix for why Josh Allen has worked out in Buffalo. I, I think if there was anybody to take a shot on Anthony Richardson and if there was any place I could put Anthony Richardson, I want to put him in New York and let him work with Brian Dable and Mike Kafka because it sounds like he is going to be back as the OC. So uh, that's that's what excites me about this move. So you give up a third round pick, jump up seven spots, and get your potential future franchise quarterback. I think that's an awesome value. Uh, and also the timeline kind of works. So this type of move would be dependent upon what happens with Daniel Jones is a long term you know uh, extension and how much guaranteed money is in the mix. Or is it just a franchise tag? We're going to roll with Jones for a year. And if that's the case, then the timeline, I think, perfectly matches up with Richardson. You know, he sits for 8, 10, 12 weeks, maybe even the entire season. And then post, you know, franchise tag expiration on Jones, you have your franchise quarterback potentially sitting in the wings waiting to take over. So I think this pick makes a lot of sense. And again, go back four months. You couldn't see a mock draft that didn't have Anthony Richardson go to the Giants. So here I think you have to move up because you know, I still think he's going top half the first round. But here at 18, I think is a, a solid spot. And like I said off top of the video, like we're starting to hear rumblings and some reports that some teams have a first round grade on Richardson and some have him as low as a day three guy, fourth round grade. So it's going to be all over the map because it comes down to how, you know, wh- where do you think it's worth taking the risk that is Anthony Richardson? I think the Giants, Brian Dable, maybe they're feeling, you know, uh, ballsy enough to go make that move, trade up to 18. So again, if you're a Giants fan or just a fan of Anthony Richardson, maybe let me know what you think about this move. Do you think the Giants would do something like this? Anyways, let's talk about Tampa Bay. And, and again, next week, I'm going to have the Giants moving up. I think trading with Seattle here at 20 for a wide receiver. So a little bit of a, a look ahead for next week. But anyways, Tampa Bay, this is when I have Bijan Robinson come off the board. It is not uh, the most sexy pick. And I know a lot of Buccaneers fans are probably tired of seeing stuff like this in mock drafts because, yeah, there's holes. But I'm kind of in a waiting period because it's like, who's your quarterback going to be next year? Because that will tell me a ton about how serious you're taking next year and, and what type of player you're, you're looking to draft. Because if you're going to roll with Kyle Trask and basically position yourself to be at the top of the 2024 draft class, I could see them want to take someone who maybe comes with a, a year or two's worth of work uh, to hit their full potential. Maybe they are more willing to take a project versus like if they sign Derek Carr, they're looking to win now. So I could see maybe a Bijan here at 19. You know, I, I knew the move on from Byron Leftwich, and I, I've mentioned this quote so many times during mock drafts, but you know, Byron Leftwich was saying not about rush yards, about rush attempts. And while he's out the building, I still think that, you know, I think that ideology and that, that way of thinking might still linger in the building. Uh, so I, I could see them being the squad that warrants, you know, a first round pick for Bijan Robinson, despite having a hole on the offensive line and at the cornerback spots and in other places in the roster. We'll see what happens with Levante David. Um, but I, I could see them being like, hey, Bijan, not just a running back. And he's not. He's not just a running back. He's a true offensive weapon, uh, awesome receiver, uh, can win with power, can win with elusiveness, has great, you know, long speed, uh, good short area quickness. Too. I mean, like, there's not much that Bijan can't do. And to me, he's the best running back prospect since Adrian Peterson. And I said the same thing about Saquon Barkley, but I, I think Bijan's that much more, that little bit more than what pro, uh, Barkley was as a prospect. And I could also argue like Adrian Peterson was the perfect running back prospect for 2007, where the NFL was at that time. And I think Bijan is like the perfect NFL prospect for where we are in 2023. So honestly, him and Adrian Peterson are kind of on level playing grounds. So it just comes down to the times in which the league was at. Anyways, talked way too long on that. Let's get into the uh, the 20s now. We get Seattle at pick 20. I'm going to have Osiris Torrance back-to-back weeks where I have this be the pick. And we're going to go interior offensive line again in this mock for uh, the Seahawks. I think they have potentially three different positions across the interior up for grabs. Torrance to me is the best guard. I know that can uh, kind of vary. Uh, him and Avila, I think, are pretty close. It comes down to do you want the the, uh, the the power scheme fit and the guy who's a better run blocker and can move people? That's so Cyrus Torrance. That said, I think he actually did do a better job in pass protection than I anticipated coming into the season. He was one of those guys that was on my interior offensive line, you know, uh, way too early rankings. And I was excited about him going from Louisiana Lafayette to Florida. I was like, yeah, pass protection feels like where we'll see him kind of uh, – have the most struggles uh, making that transition. But I think he actually held up and already seeing a guy make a transition from a smaller school to a Power 5 conference gives me confidence that he'll be able to take that next step forward once he gets to the NFL. So I'm a big fan of a Siren Storm. The other side of the same coin, it's like if you're a pass-heavy team, Steve Avila makes a ton of sense because he's probably the best interior or best pass-blocking guard available in this class. Same Andrew Voorhees kind of immediately come to mind. So comes down to preference. I think Torrance is a better fit for what Seattle wants. Let me get to the Chargers. Uh, another week where I'm going to give the Chargers a Flowers and I am going to give the Ravens Jordan Addison. Either way you spin it, whether it's Addison, then Flowers, or Flowers, uh, then Addison, I am absolutely here for it. Either way, both these teams need a receiver. Um, I, I think I like Zay Flowers as an over-the-top guy just a little bit more, and that's why, hey, with the Chargers having the first pick, of the two teams, who would they prefer? Maybe Zay Flowers, also a great yak weapon, which figures to be a good part of... Uh, 
or a good addition for what Kellen Moore did in Dallas. Now, I think that scheme's going to change a little bit, and I certainly hope it does because I'd love to see some more over-the-top work for Zay Flowers, but a guy that gives you that speed element, that deep route running ability that the Chargers have been sorely lacking. Um, and, you know, now you have two guys I think can, you know, force Herbert to stretch the ball down the field. Mike Williams, who does it in a different way than Zay Flowers, but you'd have those two guys. And even in the games where Mike Williams is out there, you just see Herbert trust pushing the ball down the field a little bit more. So hopefully adding another guy in the mix just makes it that much more uh, a part of his game and it gives him that much more confidence trying to flip the field. And then for the Ravens, like, yeah, wide receiver. I mean, how many years now we've been talking about the Ravens needing wide receiver? Um, and, and I mean, I, Lamar Jackson is going to be a franchise tag minimum. And to me, I think if he does leave Baltimore, it's not this offseason. It's probably the next one. I think if, if he does end up leaving Baltimore, it's going to be a franchise tag, play the year, another tag, and then he gets traded. Now, granted, there have been reports that if they can't come to a long-term extension, he could be on the move. So maybe another Anthony Richardson landing spot here. I, I, I don't know. But also, like, if he goes to Atlanta and they get pick eight, maybe they're looking at C.J. Stroud at eight or something like that. So plenty of different possibilities we could go down there if the Ravens do ship Lamar. But I don't think that's going to happen. I do think they work out an agreement. Honestly, I think Lamar is going to hold his stance and hold the line. And then the Ravens are going to be like, all right, fine, whatever. Whatever you need. Whatever you want. Let's do it. Uh, Todd Munkin coming in as the OC. Kind of get us back on track here. So we're going to change, see a change in the system. It's still going to be run heavy. But yeah, we've been saying for years now, they need wide receiver. And I think with that schematic change, that's enough of it, a, a catalyst uh, to... Like, hey, let's put another first-round pick in this offense on the outside. We did it with Bateman in 2021. Now let's do it with Addison here at 23. Give Lamar two legitimate starting wide receivers. Then Duvernay can kind of be our gadget uh, specialty dude in the mix. Plus, we have Mark Andrews, who's one of the best tight ends in football. Um, you know, Bijan Robinson makes it here. I think he's interesting to try to squeeze that passing or receiving ability out of him while also being an awesome runner in a run-heavy offense. So that's interesting. But I think wide receivers should be the priority uh, here for Baltimore in round one. Let me get to Minnesota. I'm going to go back to the linebacker spot another week where I just, you know, I'm saying the same stuff where they need to get faster in the middle of the field. Um, and corner is a need for sure. I just think Andrew Booth Jr. going into year two, Cam Dancer, uh, you know, getting better, uh, still in his mid 20s. And plus, like, the natural progression I think this team will take on that side of the ball going from Ed Donatel to Brian Flores is massive. Specifically in the secondary. Uh, plus, you get Lewis Seen back, first round pick uh, out of Georgia, and that crazy injury in London. So, hopefully, he comes back at 100%. So, I think that secondary is going to see some natural progression next year, both with coaching uh, as well as uh, with second year jumps uh, from Andrew Booth Jr. and Lewis Seen coming back healthy, and ideally a second year jump as well. So I'm, I'm going to address that a little bit later on. Uh, Edge could be in the mix here. Zedaria Smith, Neil Hunter, where do those guys, uh, you know, how, how are they leveraging their talents this offseason? Something to watch there. Uh, wide receiver certainly fascinating. If Jordan Addison makes it here, I'm listening. If JSN's here, maybe as an Adam Thielen replacement if he gets cut, that's interesting. Kind of like Keenan Allen and the Chargers. Or if Thielen or Allen gets cut, JSN becomes a very logical replacement for either one of those two guys because the skill sets are very similar. Nonetheless, let's get some speed in the middle of the field. Let's get a linebacker that they desperately need. Eric Kendrick sounds like a guy who's potentially going to be cut. Wrong side of 30. Or if he's not already over 30, then he's right there at it. And you kind of starting to see age take an effect where he's losing a step. And he was always a guy that kind of won with his football smarts and uh, his you know football IQ and acumen. Uh, so now that the athleticism is hitting a point where it's starting to become a, a bigger and bigger liability in this game, it's hard to justify keeping him around, especially at a lofty cap hit. So I could totally see them moving on from him. Plus, you know, Jordan Hicks, not a long-term answer there either. So you're looking at potentially needing two linebackers this offseason. So let's go ahead and address with uh, the opportunity uh, to get the first off-ball linebacker off the board. Take Trenton Simpson at 23. Next to the Jags at 24, uh, going back to, I, yeah, dare I say, I think my favorite player to team fit uh, in this NFL draft, at least as of right now. Brian Branch, perfect nickel corner, uh, strong safety hybrid for the Jags defense. You keep Darius Williams on the outside where he just plays better for whatever reason as a boundary corner. Brian Branch figures to be, you know, the guy that can perfectly slot into the slot, no pun intended. Great tackler, great man, great in zone. I think he's going to test pretty well, too. So he's one of those guys where, and plus, like, to me, he's a top 10 player in this class. It's just, you know, like, where do you take that nickel strong safety hybrid? So because of that, the Jags get fantastic value with getting him at 25. So it's shades of the Kyle Hamilton falling to 14 last year when he was probably one of the, the best eight players uh, in the draft last year. Tyler Lindenbaum falling to 25 of the Ravens when he was probably one of the top 15 players in last year's class. I think it's something similar here where Branch, for whatever reason, will fall down the board. And if he does, the Jags would scoop him up at 25. 
So now we get to the Lions. They traded back from 18 to get to 24. Sorry, I was uh, saying 25 for the Jags. Jags are 24. Lions are here at 25. Numbers are indeed hard. Uh, this is where I'm going to have Brian Brzee's fall cl- uh, come to a close. Um, I've had Brzee go at six to the Lions and some older mocks. So I think the chance to get him at 25 uh, is a, a great opportunity to snag a falling star. He needs to add some weight. And yeah, he's not a, a ready-to-go prospect per se. Uh, but I think if he adds 15 pounds, you'll get a high level of run defender because he is a freaky athlete. Um, and then you pair him up uh, with Ali McNeil there at uh, the nose tackle spot. Aiden Hutchinson, James Houston to kind of play the edge. Brian Brzee, I think, is a perfect 3-4 DN fit. And then when you get in the passing situations, nickel, dime, you know, you have McNeil and Brzee play the interior pass rushing spots. And then it's, uh, you know, Houston with Hutchinson, maybe the Aquarius rotating in there on the edge. So it starts to get to a point where we're solidifying that defensive line, which will certainly go a long way making this team better. So we've gone corner. We've gone defensive line here in the first round for the Lions defense, which certainly needs those reinforcements. Next is the Dallas Cowboys. We talked about this guy a little bit earlier on potentially the best pass-protecting interior offensive lineman, Steve Avila. Uh, to me, he is the best pass-protecting guard in this class. Uh, and for Dallas, it's like, hey, yeah, go ahead and get that uh, interior offensive lineman. I've been trying to get into a scenario where Osiris Torrance makes it here, but yeah, it's kind of becoming harder and harder because I think he's going to be in that you know 18 to 23 range, maybe 18 to 22. So in that case, I don't hate Avila as a late first round talent. I, you know, he's kind of one of those fringe guys to me. Late one, early two uh, is a good spot to take him. Uh, so here you get that Connor McGovern replacement. You slot him in at guard. Tyler Smith stays at left tackle. Tyron Steele hopefully comes back healthy. He's at right tackle. Biotis kind of becomes that weakest part of the offensive line at center. And if he's your weakest link of the O line, I think you're in a healthy spot. So uh, yeah, this is also a move like, hey, yeah, I know this team wants to run the ball, but get the best pass protector, keep Dak Prescott, you know, clean. Let's, let's keep, keep him with a smile on his face. Right. So, uh, you're gonna win the game, win a lot of games. You're gonna go deep in the playoffs by being able to win it through the air. So let's go ahead and make a move across the offensive line that will help solidify that as a strength. Next is the Buffalo Bills at 27. I'm gonna go Keely Ringo. And it's actually gonna be a kind of a, um, a secondary heavy, uh, mock for the Bills, which I'm interested to see if you're a Bills fan, like how, how much do you think they prioritize that? And, and my thinking here is the same thing Same thing I talk about with Cincinnati and the same thing I talk about with Kansas City throughout all of my mocks. You are one of the best teams in the NFL. You are going to be playing a ton of games from ahead. So kind of get out in front of potential uh, skepticism or, or pushback I get with uh, going kind of secondary heavy between today and the round three video for Buffalo. You're going to be playing a lot of games from ahead. So having a nice rotation at corner is going to be something that comes in, van- uh, comes in, uh, comes in as an advantage for the Bills. Same thing with se- uh, safety. Uh, so basically having as much safety and secondary depth as a whole will go a long way for this team continue to be one of the best teams in football. So I often say that about the Chiefs, talking about need to add more edge rushers, same thing with the Bengals, kind of same thing with cornerback position for Cincy as well. So I think Keely Ringo, yeah, it's back-to-back years where you take a first-round corner, but when you're a good team and you're playing from ahead often, having two first-round talents on the outside will help you continue to be a good team. So I would love to see this. Plus, it's almost kind of like Kyrie Elam where he's a guy I really like. Um, and I, I was super high on Ringo. I thought he could go as early as the Pats pick in the middle of the first. Uh, so I think Good on the Bills, moving up two spots, getting him, and I'm just excited to see what his future kind of grows into. But another guy with a similar body type, Elam was right around 6'1", Ringo 6'2", long arms, can run 4'3". Uh, so I know it's a zone-heavy defense. Ringo kind of profiles better as a man press corner, but the same thing was true about Elam. So I can see them doubling down on that and just saying, hey, let's go add two long-armed, tall, freaky, fast corners into our secondary. Because again, teams are going to have to play from behind. They're going to have to pass the ball against us. So let's get twitched up athletes in the secondary and let them make plays and kind of close the door on a potential comeback opportunity. So I think the fit makes a lot of sense. Uh, Let me get to the Bengals here at 28. And I'm going to have Michael Mayer just kind of fall right in their laps. I've had Darnell Washington. I think Darnell Washington kind of makes more sense because he serves as an extension for an offensive line that needs help. But here, if you're a Bengals fan, don't be mad about this. Just this is the best player available. To me, Michael Mayer is a blue chipper in this class. Like him and Bijan Robinson are the most frustrating guys to to mock because they're blue chippers. It's just their position kind of weighs them down. And you know, Brian Branch, I don't think he's a blue chipper, but he's kind of that next tier down for me. So uh, kind of the same situation we were talking about Branch earlier on uh, with him going to the Jags at 24. So if you're the Bengals here. Michael Mayer falls in your lap, best player available, sprint the card in. And also you're a year away from Tyler Boyd hitting free agency. So this could be a guy that does some more of that over the middle stuff. You can even push him out in the slot and Dame did that plenty. Uh, and he kind of vacates or takes over that role vacated by Tyler Boyd uh, in a year's time and kind of makes up for that production. And I think with Mayer and then Trent Irwin, if they keep him around as that other wide receiver, those two as an aggregate to replace Tyler Boyd is a, a feasible way to 
keep that production in house, uh, but also do it cheaper than paying and extending a, a Tyler Boyd. So would love to see this fit. And I think that's a way to in a year's time move on from Boyd. Uh, then we get to the Saints at 29. This one I'm going to have Jackson Smith and Jigba come off the board. Um, I mean, I, I, now I'm hearing stuff that Michael Thomas might get cut. You know, I just did my Saints video, and right now his cap it next year is $60 million. So if they do feel the need to cut Michael Thomas, I, I think that's probably a logical move. So if he hits the market like, whoa, what team is looking for that guy? That'd be interesting. Um, but if they do make that move, then I think JSN makes a ton of sense. Is that underneath, he'll have to work from the slot only, so he won't be able to do it on the outside like Thomas does. But JSN could perfectly kind of fill in that role of the underneath, you know, route running archetype. Uh, QB's kind of best friend because of his soft hands and ability to find a soft spot. And so that really is something that not a whole lot of people like focus on, you know, a lot of people kind of naturally put their attention on like, can you beat man coverage, right? Which obviously if you beat man coverage, that's awesome. Uh, but JSN has just such a great feel uh, against zone coverage and he can find those soft spots and sit in it. Uh, so I think man zone, he brings, you know, a nice element to this offense and it could be filling in for Michael Thomas. Again, just having to do it from the slot, which isn't ideal, but then you also pair up Chris Olave and JSN and you know, these Buckeye teammates are kind of reunited and Hey, if they keep Michael Thomas around, then we're talking about three Buckeyes uh, in that wide receiver uh, room. So I'd love to see that, but if they do move on from Thomas, then that makes it all the more that I think JSN makes a lot of sense here at 29. Then we get to the Eagles at 30. I'm going to go Antonio Johnson. This is kind of your um, Chauncey Gardner Johnson re uh, replacement insurance. Uh, I do think CJ Gardner Johnson is going to fetch a bag because he was one of the uh, NFL leaders in interceptions last year. And when he was on the field, he was awesome. So that dude's going to make a lot of money. And considering the trade, like the capital they gave up to get CJ Garner Johnson last year was the same that they basically got for Jalen Rager. This is not something where it's like, we have to sign him. We gave up a first round pick for him. They're like, no, nah, we, we basically gave up Jalen Rager for CJ Garner Johnson. And we made it to the Super Bowl. And if, you know, his contract demands are too expensive, well, we weren't going to keep Jalen Rager anyway. So we'll find a, we'll find another way to, you know, kind of fill in that role. And also with the DC change, like, C.J. Gardner-Johnson was awesome with what uh, Jonathan Gannon was doing. No guarantee the next D.C. is like, yeah, I have that role kind of in mind. Or, yeah, I'll be able to add that into what I'm thinking we should do with that team. So, you oh, we'll kind of have to wait and see if they get that extension worked out. It'll go in a different direction here. But I do think Antonio Johnson is worthy of being the first round. Six foot three, 200 pounds, kind of like Branch. Plays that nickel corner, strong safety hybrid spot. Uh, I think he's a damn good football player. Maybe not as switch up of an athlete as Brian Branch, but he's six three versus six foot. So a little bit of give and take there. Uh, in the last pick here in the first round video, the Kansas City Chiefs at 31 will take Keon White. I actually saw this in another mock and I was like, dang it, someone beat me to the punch. But this is one that makes a ton of sense. Uh, Big body, strong dude, tight end, converted to play edge, transferred from ODU to Georgia Tech. And as he's started to get more and more experience playing on the defensive side, he's just gotten that much better. Uh, started as a high-level run defender with the Monarchs at ODU. Started to figure out the pass rush moves uh, at Georgia Tech this past year with seven and a half sacks. So I think this is a guy who's still learning the position and really just now kind of figuring it all out. Uh, and a good combination of athletic ability with that frame. So I think it makes for a really nice pairing opposite of George Karloftis. And same thing we were talking about with the Bills. Like, you are a good football team. The Chiefs just won another Super Bowl. They're going to be playing from ahead in a majority of their games next year. So adding more pass rush, you can never have enough of it because... That's how you solidify games. That's how you're going to make sure that the work is done after the third quarter for Patrick Mahomes, right? Uh, so we'd love to see that type of addition. I think 31 is about the sweet spot for Keon White. You know, there was some hype around him getting maybe in the top 15. I'm more looking at Keon White as like a somewhere between 20 and 35. I think he's going to be one of the first names taken off the board in the second round if he makes it there. Uh, or he kind of features into the back half, the back third, really, of the first round. So that's kind of where I'm standing on Keon White at the moment. But that is going to do it for the first round portion of this updated 2023 NFL mock. I'll scroll across the top so you all can see these picks one more time. But be sure to let me know what you think about this first round portion of the mock down below in the comment section. Who's your favorite team? That certainly helps me out a ton. Do you like the pick? Do you not like it? And are you kind of mid on it? I'd love to hear your thoughts. And as long as you're not a jerk, I will respond to every comment down below in the comment section. So let's have a fun conversation about who I gave your favorite team in this mock draft or maybe even not even your favorite team what's a fit that you think would make for uh, a ton of sense what do you think about the anthony richardson trade i'd love to get some feedback on that as well and of course the question i started the video off with who do you think picks number one overall uh once we get to april is it the bears is it the colts is it the houston texans is it carolina you know love to hear your early predictions for who's picking at number one on uh, draft night. But that is going to do it for the first round portion of this updated mock be sure to come back tomorrow when the second round video is out at noon but until then my name is teach and i'm signing off <laughs>